team, Cordell Bank. And this place is biologically rich in invertebrates, fish species, and um, in the early, well, in the late 1970s and the early 80s, there was a group of scuba divers from the Bay Area who took it upon themselves. There was one researcher, his name was Bob Schmieder. He took it upon himself to rally a bunch of scuba divers and go out to Cordell Bank and, and see what it was like. So these individuals were using, at that time, just air and your basic scuba technology to dive to depths um, that are quite deep for that. So the shallowest point of Cordell Bank is about 112 feet. And the majority, and those are the really upper pinnacles. The, the rest of the bank is quite, quite deep. And we don't advocate scuba diving on Cordell Bank. It's uh, right now only for those who use um, technical, technical uh, equipment and get permits from the sanctuary. But anyway, back to the 80s. Um, so Bob's group, they started photo documentation, collecting species, and they were just amazed by this habitat located so close to San Francisco that no one knew what it looked like. And so after about, um, let's see, how many years did they dive? It was m maybe a, under a decade of diving. They wrote up reports, and Bob Schmieder took all that, that information back to Washington, D.C., and he, he advocated for this place to be established as a national marine sanctuary with the purpose of protecting it. Um, it was always known as a, a prime fishing spot for fishers out of um, Bodega Bay and San Francisco. So it, protecting it was important for keeping its biodiversity and um, resilience preserved. And there was a whole um, public process with establishing a National Marine Sanctuary, which I wish I was better at explaining. <laughs> but um, maybe Sage can dive more into that when she talks about Fairlands, because it's a similar public process for uh, establishing National Marine Sanctuaries. Uh, but fast forward then to 2015, the local communities uh, were advocating to make these sites even larger, uh, given th that they, they value the importance of the habitats and the biological richness. So after a lengthy public process in 2015, Cordell Bank Sanctuary was uh, doubled in size from 529 square miles to about 1,100 square miles. And with that expansion, this feature that we're going to today, Bodega Canyon, was added to the boundaries. So hence our, our, um, our interest in getting down there and surveying it so we can better understand the resources in the canyon. And once we have that data compiled, it is provided to resource managers and that helps them better manage these areas. Take it away, Sage. <laughs> well said, Caitlin. Thanks. Um, so Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary was established in um, 1981, um, again through a public process that Caitlin alluded to. Um, and then in 2015, our, we expanded our boundaries along with Cordell. Um, and primary primary mission is resource protection. Um, and so knowing what we have in our sanctuary is the first step in being able to protect our resources. So for the last previous two days, we were two, three days, we were diving up in Greater Fair north of here, north of where we are now, up in Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary. Um, and again, this was the first time we had had an ROV down in that area. And now we're down in Cordell. So... Um, yeah, but essentially these two places are established as National Marine Sanctuaries because they are just biologically uh, rich, thriving areas. Not, un not just underwater, but also with pelagic organisms like seabirds and whales. 
Right, and there's actually, um, aren't there quite a few uh, migrating birds that, that visit the sanctuaries from, from elsewhere, other places in the world? There are, there's several species that come here to feed um, because it is so biologically rich. Um, the black albatross will come here sometimes. Last, uh, we were on a bird and mammal cruise about two weeks ago and we had a Les Sands albatross um, observation, so that was exciting for us. Um, and they breed in Hawaii, so they're traveling all the way from Hawaii to here to feed. Um, there's also shearwaters come from n several different places, but I want to say New Zealand. Mm. Um, I, I thought, and also Chile? Is it Chile? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if they can. And, and I don't recall where, but, uh, and or what species, unfortunately, but, uh, oh, leatherbacks. We, we see leatherback sea turtles out here as well. Yes, you can. It is somewhat rare, but it is possible. That's astounding to me. Mm -hmm. So uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, I think there's only seven species of sea turtles in the world, and the leatherback is actually the largest. So uh, what, are the, what do they feed on here? Yeah, for the most part, jellies. Uh, yeah, we saw some really nice big jellies yesterday uh, uh, in Drake's Bay, actually. I think those were Chrysora, you is that right? Yes, you got it. <laughs> wow, well that's that's great. So, um, how can um, how can people interact or, or appreciate the, the sanctuaries? Um, can they get out on the water? Can they go to uh, um, uh, visitor centers? How can, how can we appreciate the sanctuaries? All of the above. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, there's whale watches that go out into Greater Fairlands and um, Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuaries. Um, if you're not the, not kind of hesitant on your whale watch, you can go down to Monterey Bay, which that's a shorter whale watch. Um, that's like a two to four hour. Any whale watch is coming out of going to Greater Fairlands or Cordell Bank will be an eight hour all day trip. So um, not for the faint of heart. And w there's visitor centers. Um, we have a visitor center just right on Chrissy Field. So in San Francisco, um, which is a great place to come in and our visitor center manager is excellent and um, to learn more about the sanctuary. Also there's um, it's at the Ocean Center up at Point Reyes Lighthouse. Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah. So for, for Cordell Bank, it is a bit more challenging to get into the sanctuary since the boundaries are completely offshore. There aren't too many trips that, that visit Cordell Bank. And like Sage said, you have to be a seaworthy person. <laughs> so for, the, for everyone else, there are uh, great visitor centers to go to. If you're taking a trip to the Point Reyes National Seashore and you have the time to go out to the lighthouse, there is an ocean science center out there to visit that overlooks the ocean and talks more about the, the two sanctuaries. There's also an exhibit in Oakland at mm. the Oakland Museum that is uh, specifically about Cordell Bank. Wow, that's great. And I, I actually think one of our colleagues who's on board with us um, is really excited about uh, the lighthouse uh, because I think it's, it's, it's 149 years old. And, uh, and I think they're actually going to, they've been doing some work to renovate that center. So I think that could be pretty exciting. And uh, I was actually excited this morning. I got up early to be on deck and watch the sunrise and watch us as we passed, uh, I believe we passed it, right, on our way out of Drake's Bay? We did, yeah, absolutely. We passed Point Reyes, which is where that lighthouse is, and that's affiliated with the National Park Service. Mm. And a great way to sort of stay in your living room and dive into the Cordell Bank Sanctuary is there's a radio show um, on KM, KW. KWMR, um, and that's hosted by Jenny Stock, and you can tune in there. It's called Ocean Currents, and it's also podcasted, so 
she has great shows and um, she actually did one while she was out here on the ship this week. Hmm. Wow, great. Good info. If you guys happen to, to see any, anything uh, cool or interesting as we're descending, we've been trying to keep an eye on the screen. I think I saw like a, a couple of shrimp, but I'm not sure if I've seen much else. I think we're about halfway there, a little bit. We're at 1,400 meters. Is that so? Fourteen hundred meters. Um, when in Gary's talk yesterday, he was talking about the three zones: the sunlit zone, the mesophotic zone, and then uh, where we're going to be exploring. It's called the midnight zone. But do you guys remember um, the depths where that delineate those those three zones? No, but the way I think they describe those three zones is like the, the topmost zone is where you have the most amount of light, so you have a lot of primary production, lots mm. of plankton. Uh, and then when you get to the mesophotic zone, there's like, it's almost kind of like the twilight zone too. It's There is some light, but, it, you know, not as much. And then when you get down to the midnight zone, it's just dark. Um, I don't remember the depth zonations though, but like that's how I remember it by light, like how much light is present in each of these zones. Oh. And f for those viewers, I believe that was Magda, right? Yes. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a treat to hear from you. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Uh, Sage, one of our viewers is curious, um, was wondering if you could uh, say again where the, the Laysan albatross was spotted. Oh, where were we? We were... On line six. <laughs> so, that, <laughs> so that's near the, oh. that's near the Farallons. We lines. were out past the Farallon Islands. Oh, okay. Yes. And primarily they hang around the, the shelf break, right? So is that what, do you recall? Yeah, I, I do believe we were out past the, the islands. Yeah, which, and around here the shelf break is about 200, at 200 meters depth. So those albatross stay offshore quite a bit. Hmm. And... I don't know much about those albatross at all. Is there anything else you can tell us about them? or like? Oh, I do have a fun fact about black-footed albatross. Their wingspan is six feet. Wow. Does that make them the largest of the albatrosses? Oh, boy. I don't know about that. The oh. laysan? The, the blackfoot. The black blackfoot. The blackfoot. I thought laysan were the largest. But I don't, I've, I've seen laysan, and they're really, really big. But I mm -hmm. haven't seen blackfooted up close, so... Hmm, interesting. Um, one of our viewers has a question for our pilots. Is curious uh, about the cameras on Hercules. Are they all dome view ports? Oh, the pilots might be in, in conference right now, so they may be offline. Oh, sorry. One of our, uh, one of our viewers is just curious um, if all the if the video cameras on the Hercules are all dome ports, they're all dome ports. Mm, I don't believe so. Let's just elaborate. <laughs> 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 right, I mean, we have we have. Are they are they implying that they that the cameras have domes on them? I guess they they just said they said dome view ports. Right, okay, so they're probably talking about the lens. So we have a couple of cameras with what we consider domes on them, or camera domes. Mm. Um, but we have some that don't have those dome-shaped lenses. Um, yeah, so there's. it depends. I think we have, let's see here, one, two, two cameras on Hercules that have this dome-shaped lens, and the rest of the six other ones on there are not... And okay. one on Argus. So we, we have a total of eight cameras on board Hercules. Um, what, uh, why, why do those two have the dome view ports? What sort of advantage does that, that give? Well, one of them's on the HD camera, and that it gives you much nicer images. Um, also, I mean, if you think about it, things that are dome-shaped like that are made of a continuous piece of glass. Um, 
if not continuous, then it's something that's, I think it's like plasma, some plasma laser, some fancy technique in order to bond together glass. So, I mean, it's more expensive to have those types of um, dome shaped uh, lenses, I guess you could say, which increases your price point, but it has better optics hmm. uh, as opposed to just a flat surface. Um, yeah. And then the bubble cam actually, I mean the dome shaped, the dome shaped piece of glass that's around the bubble cam is so that we can actually see around and basically 180 degrees in one way and 360 degrees in another way um, around us. So it gives us a wider field of view. Hmm. Oh, excellent. That's fascinating. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Related to cameras, I had a converse, I was in a conversation the other day with, um, Gary and Caitlin, and they were just talking about how with the HD cameras coming on board, we're able to, they're able to identify a species um, better just because they have better visuals on them. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Hmm. Really, the, um, just the, the improvement in the, in the image quality really helps that much, huh? It absolutely does. It's not just an identification, it's actually detectability. Wow. So in the 90s when I started, well, I didn't start watching the 90s. I, I started analyzing underwater video that was collected in the 90s, and it was standard definition. Um, it, at times it w it's tricky to, to see just much um, of the species, or t just to, to, to detect them, let alone identify them to the lowest taxonomic level. Also, the advancements in lights that are on the vehicles is so helpful. Because we could draw again. Hmm. That's interesting. Like, uh, so back to pilots. Uh, on the vehicles, those lights, are they LED lights? How many and how many, how much light do they produce? The vast majority of them are LEDs now. There's only a couple of incandescents on there. I don't have a total lumens number for you right now, actually. Hmm. And um, is it uh, the LEDs just, uh, is it better color or is it better um, better illumination or is it just a combination of both? Well, so much better. It's just you can get a lot more, you can get a lot more bang for the power budget. Hmm. Um, they've come a long way over the years, but uh, so they're, they're LED, you can get, we have like very nice LED lights now, but well, traditionally, there's big kind of HMI, like incandescent lights that throw uh, a very light, a very pretty light, but uh, but their power budget is very high. Hmm. Awesome. Thank you. Ten thousand pounds on that one. Can we reset the peak on there? Can we reset the peak on there? Because that was just from lunch. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Oh, there was a, was that a Chrysora jelly that just passed by us? No, we're a little too deep for a Chrysora, but that one is certainly in our books. We could find that one. What was it that you saw, Dave? Um, just over on the right-hand side, um, I saw the bell of a large jelly. It was a solid color. 
Okay. Um, like a deep, deep purple. Oh. Or maybe even a black. So it was really, if it was purple, it was a dark purple. Yeah. It looked pretty good sizable. Eye, eye. How big does that get? Does it? Does that book say? No, <laughs> we're trying to. Well, yeah. Oh, sorry. We're trying to look into. I'm not sure. Hey Dave. Mm hmm what, what was your background again? You work at a camp? Uh yeah, so I um I work at a, a camp on Catalina Island, um That's right. located at Emerald Bay, where I run uh the Marine Science Center there. Right. So it's right. called the Pennington Marine Science Center. Yeah, you guys have some cool toys there, right? Um actually we do. Um we um we have uh, we have actually two ROVs that we have been playing around with as well. Um, one of them, the one that we we use most often, is actually um, a Blue Robotics Blue ROV2. Um, we are using that uh, on a couple of different projects. One to um, identify and track and um, sort of characterize the habitat of giant sea bass that are out on the island. And then the other one, and the other project that we're using that uh, on is to explore and um, find deeper reefs, um, anything past 130 feet. But we have a mac we have an operating depth um, where we can get down to about, I think, about 450 feet. We're limited by our tether, um, and we're hoping to find deeper reefs uh, there in Catalina. Um, and w and with our and we we actually work with the um, Catalina MPA collaborative, and our hope is actually that we might find some mm -hmm. interesting reef um, that's a, a, at these deeper depths that may qualify to be um, eventually become a marine a deep water marine protected area. So um, so we use those two toys uh, to to do that work. And we've also got um, something that we we modified um, from uh, the California Academy of Sciences work that they do in the Philippines. They've got these recompression chambers that they that they developed where they go down on on rebreathers. Um, I think that they get to about 400 feet, and they they've been able to collect um, new species of, of fish in the Philippines um, and deep water corals using that method. Um, so we actually um, have adapted their chamber design and we're able to go down to our maximum diving depth of 130 feet, um, collect fish from, from those depths, um, bring them back up without, having the, without them having suffering any bear trauma. So and we've actually also been able to do some hook and line fishing, um, where we're bringing fish from up uh, just over 200 feet. I think the maximum depth that we brought a fish up from um, is about 230 feet, and we can actually pop that fish in the chamber, and um, and then um, using uh, using uh, some 
trying to think of what the valves are called. We can actually control the pressure in that chamber uh, and take those fish back down to over 200 feet um, where they will actually um, normalize inside that chamber and then um, and then we can bring them slowly up over the course of a week and actually um, have those fish do do very well and um, and have them on display so um, that way we can we can show our, our visitors um, what kind of what kind of animals live in in the deeper water habitats and and why it's important to to look there as well so um, yeah and we actually have um, during the summer we're a boy scout summer camp or I should say a scouting summer camp and um, we have typically over 650 uh, around 650 scouts and scouters um, visiting us each week um, and then during the spring and the fall we we have a, we work with a uh, another company, Naturalists at Large, and we are also um, currently developing and running our own outdoor ed program. So ideally we'll have schooled kids in the spring and the fall, um, hopefully um, up, up to about 250 each week. Um, and we're focusing on um, teaching them marine science, um, getting them out in the water, doing like plankton toes, snorkeling, um, getting hands-on hands on, uh, marine science experience so that they can sort of develop a, a greater appreciation and love of the ocean. Um, and similarly, we do that with um, on-land uh, uh, programs as well. So uh, earth and natural sciences, um, we take them out on nature hikes um, where, they, where they do bird identification. Um, they can also um, help with conservation projects. Um, and we have a big um, we have a big focus on sustainability, leadership, conservation. So we're we're really trying to um, help kids understand science, um, become more science literate, um, and our programs are geared toward next generation science standards as well. So um, it's a great opportunity for for kids to get out and and learn about the environment and develop uh, an appreciation for it. Sounds like a great opportunity. Yeah, it's it's a great place to live and it's a great place to work. I mean, the programs that we 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 run, um, you know, they're they're um, I hope hopefully they they're very impactful and um, and you know help improve people's understanding of of the world that we live in and why we should appreciate it and, and preserve it. So. Good job. Mm -hmm. It's like a good combination between like education, outreach, and also doing your own like research projects and involving students in it. So getting you know introducing them to doing research as well. It sounds like a like a very like well-rounded program. Oh yeah. Well, thank you. I, I do feel like we're really lucky. We our mission statement is education, conservation, um, exploration, and um, in that in that context we actually get to do um, all three of those things our, our primary goal of course is working with kids and and um, and and teaching them and mentoring them we we have an intern program that works with college students and then um, through UCSB and the Macaulay lab at UCSB we've actually been um, working with them getting college age students out uh, out to camp as well and doing a Having them learn about the environment uh, uh, out in out at Catalina there as well. So, mm. we we touch base with all all kinds of age groups and uh, yeah, and we get to do a, a really unique um, combination of work. So it's it's uh, very rewarding. Well, thanks for sharing that, Dave. Well, thank you for asking. <laughs> and that was Aaron who asked you. Thanks oh. for asking, Aaron. <laughs> oh, thanks, Aaron. <laughs> no worries. I think we talked quite a bit at the um, communication workshop, and I just wanted a reminder. You, you told us a bit about your work. Oh, yeah, thanks. That Gosh, that seems like so long ago. It was so long ago. <laughs>
It says 3310. 3310. Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. We're going but deeper than 3,000 meters. That, yeah, so that's the depth of that target where the ship is. It looks like we're going to um, probably come in a bit shallower when we, where we land. So just trying to figure out. <laughs> but I, you know how I feel about contours? Yes. <laughs> Don't have to tell everybody again. I think you should express it. <laughs> we <laughs> have time. Frustration <laughs> yeah. contour lines. Please, rant about contours there. <laughs> you got a thousand meters. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I could definitely say um, shallower. Okay. But not, not a huge amount. The, the colored contours on high pack are five meters. Oh, the, wow. The oh. black are 50. So it's not. Not a big deal. Oh. Oh, the black are 50 in this one. Yeah. Yeah, it changed it all up. Ooh. Can folks Let's tuning see. in see this high pack screen if they do a quad view? Uh, no, not no. normally. They have to switch over. Video can do a switch over if mm -hmm. we want to show something, but it's not normally showing that. So it's a bit of a mystery what we're talking about. Yes. They can't see. Yes, ah. I know. Yeah. I, I also would like them to be able to see because um, yeah. I think it's important to have a feeling for what we're talking about. Do you want to take the time and talk about what you see and what we're talking about when we Would mean slow down a little contours down? and put sights? Yeah, we can. I don't know how hard it is for video yeah. to switch it over, though. Ashley would have to answer that question. Nav, what's the name of that monitor? Oh, what is the name of that monitor? I don't know. Let me find out. Oh, PC3 from downstairs. What did you say, Ashley? Um, that, yeah, that kind of purpley green stuff is what we're trying to get up. Oh, I see it. I just, I logged into Nautilus Live. So it's on quad? I, yeah. Okay. It's tiny. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, that, I think that's part of the reason, too. Like, mm -hmm. it's really hard to see on the quad view. Mm -hmm. No. Uh, well, on the tiny screen, <laughs> talk about it a bit. Um, so we are exploring this feature called Bodega Canyon. Um, this is more the proper canyon here. It's hard to see my mouse, but that kind of stair step feature. We're looking at a slope map as well, so that's important. It's not bathymetry, but colored by slope. And there's kind of a, a wider canyon that continues up through here. Our planned transit or for this ROV dive is along along this wall um, where you can kind of see the black X's. Um, there are different waypoints. So we're coming down around 1A and then stepping up along 
and stepping um, into the slope kind of. So that's kind of the overview map and high pack and that's what we are following along as the nav, we're, we're watching that. I zoom in on an area. So right now we're, we're coming in on 1A and the ship's there. And the ROV is a bit upslope from the ship. So it's kind of what we were talking about that. And I, I can't see that from this color map because of slope. But if I go to uh, the layer manager and turn on some contours, um, I can see that we're, we're stepping stepping up slope. So these are colored or five meter contours and black or 50 meters. And we can't get depths on this map, which is a bit frustrating. It's just an image. So we, we kind of estimate our depths based on um, how many contours it is between point A and point B. I see. It's not like you can click on the pixel and yeah. get the depth. So it's not a super smart grid. Mm -hmm. I was just visiting. Jamie? Jamie's in the back row. Visiting. Jamie's joined us. We have a, a guest, a data person. <laughs> it's hey. me. The master <laughs> of data. Um, one of our other data loggers has a uh, phone conference that they need to do. Okay. So I'm sitting in for a little bit. Okay, welcome, Jamie. Thanks. Welcome to We're the blue water. Talking <laughs> about oh, welcome to blue water. We were talking about the dive site. You want to hear more? Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> All right. Oh, anyways, this is when we talk about high pack. This is the screen that we're talking about. That's how we monitor position of the vessels and the ROVs, um, and how they relate to each other. It's also how we measure distance. Um, uh, so using different tools to check distances. And when I'm using this tool, the, the distance comes up in the bottom left corner. So I know from one waypoint to the next, it's about 700 meters, which takes quite a while. Uh, but when we're planning these dives and like getting ready, we use other pieces of software that have a little more information. Um, so that's kind of these screen captures. Um, they were taken from a piece of software called Flader Mouse. Um, which is a QPS bit of software. And so this is a screen capture, a perspective view of where we're landing on the dive site. So we're, that's the point the ship's over. We're actually a little bit up this way. So on a, a less slopey area, but we'll have to move a bit down slope to get to that first waypoint. And then we're gonna be coming along these steep walls. Again, this is colored by slope and you can see the, the track line is up against that wall. So we have to be pretty careful with that as the wind is also kind of pushing us in into that slope. So we wanna explore it carefully. Um, so that's the first couple waypoints. And again, this is makes it look like it's really short, but that's like 700 meters between those two spots. So that's a lot further than you think it's gonna be. Mm -hmm. And then we had a kind of a perspective view of the whole dive. Um, that's what our, our dive looks like looking into the canyon. Again, a bit hard to see, colored by slope, but you can see that kind of gentle stepping going up the center of the canyon, but we're really gonna be clinging to these really high slope areas along the wall. So that's, that's the story for, for mapping in this dive. Great story, thank you. You're welcome. So those, on that, on that image that you have there, those rises, how, how high up are those rises that we see here, these canyon walls? Um, let's count contours. Stand by. <laughs> <laughs> My apologies, Aaron. Ooh, I like right. this game. We can, we, can, we can do that later, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the frustration. Um, but no, we can guess that. Like a 100 meter wall or? Um, like well, that, I mean, that kind of looks like base right there. If I zoom out. No, not that. Yeah, the tall one. Up here, these yeah. really tall ones. Yeah, they're really tall ones. Um, so the features are probably 200 meters a wall okay. from base, but we'll be coming in kind of in the mid mid zone. Okay. Two hundred meters of wall over like 600 meters. So the slope is like a 40 degree slope. Can I do math right? No. It's 40 in the highest bit, so 200 meter rise from there to there, right? 50, 100, one fi maybe 150. 50, 150, 100, 100. I'm talking to myself, yeah, 150 um, over 250 meters. Okay. Mm. 
that's Sounds that. good. There it is. Thank you. Now, video, you can switch <laughs> it back. <laughs> you go through all that trouble again. So, Caitlin, when we uh, when we slow at 100 meters mm -hmm. um, off bottom, then what's what's gonna you guys are gonna do a video transect of the midwater, or what's the idea for that slow? I believe just to slow it down so that any critters that do appear in the video can be uh, better identified. But in terms of an actual transect, um, that I don't have specific instructions on. I think just the key is to slow the speed. Okay, but yeah. we, can, we can move the video ca the camera so that it's maybe it should be unobstructed by hoses and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Right. Yeah. That sounds good. What speed is the ROV going down at now? Twenty-seven. About. Tw okay. So just half of that. Yeah, 27 meters per minute. Sorry, just specify. Yeah. Half speed says, on vehicle descent, last 100 meters at half speed for a video of midwater species. Okay. Because they do zip by pretty fast. So if we go slower, then they can move slower. <laughs> Except for the ones with little jet packs on them. Those. Yes. Those are harder to get. I've heard mixed, mixed things.
Um, so this looks like it's a good time to answer some questions for our, from our viewers. Um, to um, to the person who watches the eagle cams on Catalina Island, um, if they're feeding on a lot of orange fish, those are probably actually Garibaldi. So um, yeah, the the eagles tend to be um, fish. Uh, they they do tend to focus on feeding on fish. And uh, those Garibaldi's are both plentiful and often near the surface. Um, anything reddish could be actually a sheephead wrasse, which are also very common and plentiful uh, near the surface uh, in Catalina. Um, Caitlin and Sage, are there? Do we know of any like predatory organisms that feed on the on the deep water corals? We have seen nudibranchs eating corals, um, these really large Tritonia nudibranchs. Oh. Mm -hmm. I haven't, maybe maybe we'll see it on this dive. I did not see it when we were in Box Canyon. I didn't actually realize Tritonia was down this far. Um, is it, are, are they, are the Tritonia, are they, are they, are they large and brown with, Flat and flattish with spots, or am I thinking of a totally different nudibranch? There might be different species of Tritonia. These ones I'm thinking of are pink, and ah. they're pink because of the pink polyps they're eating. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. We actually sampled a Tritonia nudibranch on one of the dives oh. recently, yeah. Oh, really? Okay, yeah. Oh. Was it on a coral? I think it was on soft sediment, Okay. Um, but maybe it was traveling between coral. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, uh, how big was that Tritonia? Are these Tritonia, do they get quite large? They can be quite large. How big uh. was the one you collected? The one we collected was like a few centimeters. That's like 10 centimeters? Eh. She's, she's putting her fingers <laughs> apart. <laughs> I, think, I think more like Less than ten. Okay. Five plus. Oh, interesting. Yeah, those are quite big. And the uh, the serrata, the the uh, does it have serrata on the on the back? That are are they, and are they all pink? Those are the serrata are the um on uh those are the like the gills, the gills, extra gills on the on the back of a uh, of a lot of nudibranchs. Yeah, they do have the gills. Yeah, on the so. Back. We sampled two nudibranchs, and one of them was Tritona, and one was Trionia, and I'm having trouble remembering which was which. Oh, hmm. Yeah. Interesting. I don't think that, I personally, I don't think that I'm familiar with those, so uh, maybe we'll find some more. And uh, besides the, the corals and maybe some glass sponges, um, are there any other sorts of organisms that you anticipate um, seeing down in the canyon today? We'll probably see those the deep water fish, uh, Pacific flatnose and grenadiers. Okay. And most likely brittle stars other types of sea stars. Urch. The the Rathbanaster maybe? I this is too deep for that. Too them. deep, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. Some urchins, maybe we'll see some crabs. Maybe we can chase a crab again and like that dungeness the other night. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's right. We won't this is way too deep for dungeness crab. <laughs> I'm sure there'll be plenty of sea cucumbers. And it really is the land of the invertebrates at these depths. Huh. Um, uh, one of our viewers is asking, um, since we're, gosh, are we really getting close to Halloween already? Um, they're wondering if there's anything down there that um, will be spooky. Yeah. Considering what you think is spooky. <laughs> yeah, it's fairly subjective. You could go between nothing and everything, depending <laughs> on the individual. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, I'll just have to keep watching and find out if they consider any of this stuff spooky. spooky. 
Oh. There might be sea spiders. Ooh, sea spiders, that's good. Mm -hmm. And what else would be spooky? I think the the deep water fishes look kind of spooky to me because their eyes are so large. Oh, yeah. They do have like a bit of a ghostly look. Hmm. Oh, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. We're deeper than but that black spongy coiled stuff that we saw under the rock. <laughs> You're not recalling? No. Okay. <laughs> what could be spooky? <laughs> Well, there you go. We're in for some scary times. Hopefully, hopefully some some good exploration as well. Be fun if we saw a vampire squid. That would oh, be spooky. That would be fun. That would be great. It'd be very fun. Yeah. Well, um, vampire squid. What what depth um, do they often get seen at? Do you guys know? We are going to look that one up. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I'm just, I, I'm curious. Well, we are too. <laughs> oh, will we see any ghost sharks? I don't think we have ghost sharks. I don't think so. Okay. Vampire squid are found between 300, or so 90 meters and nine over 900 meters. So that sounds to me like... It's possible. Hmm. Yeah, so that's a possibility. That'd mm -hmm. be cool. Well, all you vampire squid out there, hope you're listening and you decide to show <laughs> up. Um, somebody wants to know who would win in a fight, a hagfish or a monkfish? I'm not really sure what a monkfish is. Do you guys know what mo a monkfish is? I don't. Sounds big. Yeah. I don't know that I think a hagfish would win because it is an, an, an agnathan, so it's got no jaws. So. Right, this monkfish has major teeth. Oh, really? Yeah. I can tell you who would win between a lingcod and a hake. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the lingcod won between hake and rockfish, right? Yes. <laughs> True. <laughs> what about like a sea star and krill? Oh, hands down, sea star. <laughs> How many hands? <laughs> <laughs> or arms, I should say. Um, hmm. Sony wants to know if anybody here works, also works for the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration. Um, I don't. Not me. Me neither. <laughs> Someone on the ship does? I don't know, possibly. Um, maybe maybe the pilots. I, I think they're not always on board Nautilus all the time, right? I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, but then again, I don't really know uh, know that organization. For uh, for those of you just tuning in, we are hoping to hit a max depth of just over 3,000 meters today, um, and the length of the dive should be around 12 hours, ending at about midnight tonight. Hmm. So Sage, did you finish those green M&Ms? I still have them. I haven't even dipped into them yet. What? It is early. I will, I will. And we're going to have blue water at the when we're coming up tonight, so oh, that's gotta right. save them. Oh, that's right. Do you think we'll actually be on when when we're coming up? Um, possibly. Could be. Depends oh yeah, what, what time. if we what if we switch out just for the d the ascent? That could be uh very likely. <laughs> um, sorry, greetings to our viewer from Cambridge, UK. Welcome.
Well, let's see. We should actually be getting... We're getting pretty close, aren't we? Yep. We are getting close. We are at 2,700 meters going to 3,300 meters. It's, well, it's relatively close. It's <laughs> still a little ways. Oh, I, um, Sage, I believe Drew is saying hello to you. Is this Drew Devlin? Uh, or is this another Drew? No, that is Drew Devlin. Oh. Hi, Drew. Hi, Drew. And that's Dave. That, yeah, this is Dave. Uh, Drew and I worked together a long time ago at the Cal California Academy of Sciences, so. I would be remiss to not give a shout out to Hart and Dawn as well. Ah, excellent. So we're at almost 2,700 meters now. So shouldn't be too much longer, right? And just a reminder to viewers that uh, I think within the last, at about 2,900 meters, we are going to slow down just in case we see something interesting to allow um, video and photo to get good images.